about to begin this evening a new book, a book that we haven't been studying recently, the book of Obadiah. Now, last week we continued and completed the book of Amos. Tonight we begin our discussion of the book of Obadiah. So if you please turn to that book with me and we'll have a little review uh, of some background information before we get into the book. Uh, but as we turn to the book of Obadiah, let's go ahead and read a couple of verses so we begin our uh, understanding. But before we do that, a couple of things I want to mention. Let's go back to the, our overview of Bible history. And we've talked about 15 periods of Bible history. The prophets, as we think of the books of prophecy, uh, the major and minor prophets, uh, were written during as you see on the chart, periods 9 and, be, and following, the divided kingdom, Judah alone, Babylonian captivity, and the restoration of Israel. Those were the periods when these various books were written. And in particular, uh, we've been focusing on the divided kingdom and the ones we've been studying recently. That is, the period when uh, the northern tribes had rebelled against Judah, and you had two nations uh, from the people of Israel. And eventually, the northern tribes went into captivity, and then you just had Judah alone. They went into Babylonian captivity, and eventually they returned from captivity. But the books we've looked at so far, Hosea, Joel, and Amos, all, as far as I can tell, pertain to the period of divided kingdom. Hosea and Amos were written to the northern tribes, uh, but Joel, uh, not completely sure when it was written, uh, but I think it was written during this period, but written to the southern tribes. Uh, Obadiah has a similar situation, we'll see as we get into it, not really completely sure when it was written, uh, and we'll see it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference when it was written, uh, but probably during this period as well. And then later on we get to uh, uh, Jonah. We'll see that it also was written during this period, and then Micah as well. And then later on some of the other, later, the other books will be written in uh, later periods. The themes, I want to remember and try to pick out something from each book that we find especially helpful to remember as a theme for the book. The book of Hosea, remember, had to do with comparing uh, Hosea's wife, Gomer, who was unfaithful to him, compared to the people of Israel who were unfaithful spiritually to God. The book of Joel was used the locust plague as an illustration of uh, the need for Israel to repent or be punished. Amos, we just finished, was talking about how Israel would go into captivity because they were guilty of sin like the nation surrounding them. And now we're going to see how that Obadiah uh, deals with uh, Edom and the, the Edomites and God's punishment upon them. Okay, well, let's go ahead and read the first couple of verses and then we'll discuss the theme and some other points before we go on. We'd like to read then, there's only one chapter. We'd like to read Obadiah verses 1 and 2. Bill, please. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise and let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. Okay. So let's look at some things, some introductory material. First of all, looking at your questions. Uh, first of all, who does it say it wrote the book? Obadiah, very good. <laughs> but the question then remains, who is this Obadiah? So it's not quite so easy as it might seem on the surface because we have more than one Obadiah in the Old Testament. So any comments on what Obadiah this may have been? Any of you have a thought about that? Okay, as far as I can tell, there's really no way to tell which Obadiah it is. There's an Obadiah, you may remember in 1 Kings, um, chapter 18, who uh, had protected prophets from uh, Jezebel, who was slaying a number of the prophets. It's another Obadiah later on in the book of Second Chronicles, I think it is, who was uh, responsible for uh, the, uh, let's see what it say it was. Uh, it's his overseer in the works of the, work of the temple, Second Chronicles chapter 34. So uh, I don't really know which Obadiah it was. It makes a difference which Obadiah we, you think, therefore what you think when the book is written. Uh, however, as far as I can see, it really doesn't make a big difference. If it mattered, the Lord would tell us. Uh, what matters is 
who it's written to. And who it's written to has really nothing to directly do with uh, the time as such because it's written to another nation other than Israel or Judah. But any other comments on the question of who was uh, the author, the inspired author? Okay, he does claim inspiration, however, in the first verse. And what does he say that shows that he was in inspired? What does he say that demonstrates his inspiration or claims inspiration in verse 1? Terry. He says that the Lord spoke to him. Thus says the Lord. All right. Thus says the Lord. And further, we have heard a report from the Lord. So it's a message from God. It's an inspired message. That's the important thing for us to remember. Okay? Um, all right, so as you see on the chart then, I've divided, even though it's only one chapter, I've divided it up into three sections. The first few verses predict punishment for God upon the nation of Edom. And then the next section uh, tells why they were being going to be punished. And the last part predicts then blessings upon Judah instead of Edom. Okay? So that's what we have pretty much in the book. All right, so that brings us then to the subject of who is Edom. Uh, it says plainly in verse 1, Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. So let's discuss Edom, and this relates to some of your questions then. Um, you, question number four. What do you know about the nation of Edom? Who is Edom, and what do you know about them? Somebody tell me something you know about Edom. Terry. They came from Esau. They were children of Esau. Okay, descendants of Esau. Okay, anything else about Edom that you know? Right. Um, uh, es Esau was a twin of Jacob that we find in Isaiah 30 and verse 8, and Edom was considered vain and profane, and they rejoiced at Judah's troubles. Okay, so uh, Jacob and Esau were twin brothers. Uh, sons of Isaac and Rebekah and Esau was the older of the two even though they were twins he was the first to come and he should then have had the promise fulfilled uh, we expect the promise to Abraham to be fulfilled through him but because he was profane he sold his birthright and so on uh, God changed it and had it to come through Jacob other comments through Edom about Edom let me go ahead and give a little bit more information on our charts here. Here's a chart I've made to try to help us grasp some significance here. So the descendants of Abraham. So first of all, remember that Abraham had a number of sons. Uh, if you think about who's the son of Abraham, first of all, you think of Isaac, because that was his son through his wife Sarah. But remember, before that, he had a son by Hagar, and that was Ishmael. But that wasn't all. We sometimes forget after Sarah died, he had another wife, Keturah, and had a number of sons by, by way of Keturah. So Abraham had a number of sons, but the promises that God made to Abraham about his descendants, be a great nation, receive the land of Canaan, and through them with a great blessing on all nations, which was fulfilled in Christ. Those promises would come through, in each case, at each generation, one particular son. So God would choose a son. Even though there had been a, more than one, he would choose one. So Abraham's sons, it was Isaac, not Ishmael, not the sons of Keturah, but Isaac, that the promise was to come through. Then Isaac married Rebekah, and they had Jacob and Esau. Esau being the ancestor of the Edomites. Jacob being the ancestor of the people of Israel, uh, the Israelites. And so here you have again two sons of the same generation, but the promises are going to come true through both of them. God had to choose, and so he chose Jacob. Now that's going to be significant because it pertains to the conflict between the nations as we'll go along. Okay? Questions or further comments, discussion on who Esau was and what you know about Esau? Susie. Well, when he gave up his blessing and he realized what had happened, he did ask um, Isaac for if he didn't have some blessing to give him. And Isaac did tell him that he would live in a land and prosper, but he would live by the sword. Um, and we see that that is the character of the Edomites. 
um, throughout throughout history. Okay, so um, again, that relates to the subject we're going to be studying in the Book of Edom, uh, Obadiah two about Edom, that uh, they were a warlike people. In fact, it goes all the way back even before they were born. God made a statement about the two sons, which showed there would be conflict between them, which continues and even today. Uh, we can see the effect of it. How do you see the effect of this conflict even today? Any thoughts on that? Well, who are the Jewish people fighting mainly with these days? Palestinians. Yep, Palestinians, the Arabs. The Arabs are largely the descendants of Ishmael and Esau, the Edomites. Now there's other people that intermarried, and as such, the, the Edomites lost their identity as a nation, which we'll see as a fulfillment of the uh, prophecies we're going to be talking about. So they don't exist as a nation, but those people that are uh, the Arabs and the Palestinians and so on that are so upset with Israel and all the time wanting to start wars, it seems like, uh, that's, they're the descendants of these same people that we're talking about here. Okay? All right, so let's look a little bit more now. Uh, okay, location of Edom. You see in the chart, we same, use the same chart in Amos, but uh, there are the nations around Israel. And the map, you see clear down to the south, south of the Dead Sea is where Edom was located. Okay, you see Judah uh, pretty much west of the Dead Sea and the nation of Israel north of Judah. Uh, so Edom was close to Judah. And so... Uh, there was conflict between them. This contributed to the conflict as well. Okay? What else? Okay, so we got conflict. Um, so let's look at what it says in the... Uh, oh, wait a minute. Am I sure I'm ready for that? Okay. All right. um, as we look at the... Uh, back now, verse 1. The messenger comes, and what does the messenger say? What's going to happen according to this messenger? In verse 1. What's the messenger say? Rick. Tell them the people to rise up against them. All right, there's going to be some people to rise up in battle against her. And he's talking about Edom now, it says in the first part of the verse. And what's going to happen as a result? As a result of this. These nations rising up against her for battle, what's going to happen in verse 2? They're going to be overwhelmed. All right, they're going to be overwhelmed. They'll be small among the nations and greatly despised. Okay. So here we go all the way back now. And here we see this nation is as a nation, not just a few people, as a nation. That in general, they're going to be small, insignificant, and despised. Now again, that also goes back to the character of uh, Esau, or the descendants of Esau, from the time that Esau and Jacob were alive. So I want you to look in Romans chapter 9 with me, please. And I ask you to look at this in studying for tonight. Romans chapter 9, and we'll look at verses 10 through 13. This is question number 8. And look at some things that it says here about Jacob and Esau. And we'll see how this reflects itself in this, the Edomites, and in particular then the book of Obadiah. Romans chapter 9, and let's read verses 10 through 13. Romans 9, verses 10 through 13. And who'd like to read that for us, please? Romans 9, verse 10 through 13. Tara, uh, Frank, please. <coughs> and not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our father Isaac, uh, though they were not yet born and had done nothing e either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She, she was told the older will serve the younger. And 13 is. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. 
All right, now this relates then to our topic, because here we have prophecies. The first one says, the older will serve the younger. That's Esau then would be a servant to Jacob, which you would not expect it. The older to serve the younger. But that was prophesied, it says, even before they were born, when they were still in the womb of Rebekah. And then the second prophecy, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So we need to understand what this means. Uh, it relates to our study. but also relates to uh, Calvinism. This passage in Romans 9 is one of the main passages used by Calvinists to try to uh, argue unconditional predestination, uh, that every individual is chosen by God either to go to heaven or hell, eternal life, eternal punishment, before they're born unconditionally. has nothing to do with their choice, their conduct, or anything about their, them. God just chooses. This one's going to be saved. That one's not going to be saved. And they say that's what's going on here, you see. They say before they were born, God chose the elder will serve the younger, and that's God's plan according to election. And so they say, see, that means God's choosing, just like he did them, he chooses everybody, going to go to heaven or hell. Eternal uh, punishments, eternal destinies, based on God's pre predestination before the world began. All right, so I ask you to study on that. Uh, question number nine, and the prophecy, the significance of it. What does it have to do with our nations that we're studying, and does it teach that God chooses individuals to be saved or lost before they're ever even born. Comments? Debbie. Esau, Esau made some very unhealthy choices when he gave Jacob the um, birthright. He chose to do that. It wasn't taken from him. He could have kept it. He could have been the elder and things would have been different, but he didn't. So God uses that as his reason for letting Jacob succeed. Okay, so Esau did have a choice, didn't he? But even as Debbie was talking about, the choice that Esau made, was that a choice about salvation? No, it wasn't about salvation, was it? It was about the, uh, the birthright. He, so he had a choice, but that didn't have anything to do with, with whether he was going to be saved or lost. Could he have repented after that and been saved? Of course he could have. Because we know, because we know that people have the power to choose. We have free will. The scriptures teach it in numerous passages of scripture. Okay? So that, the choice that didn't have anything to do with uh, eternal salvation anyway. Okay? Other comments on, uh, the, first of all, these, well, Romans 9, these statements, the older will serve the younger. Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. Other comments? Susie? Well, the idea of love and hate is not as like we think of it today. Um, love is preferred and hate is love less. Um, and we see other passages um, like in Genesis 29 where it refers to verse 30 and 31 where it says Rachel was loved but Leah was hated. Well, we know Leah wasn't hated, but she was loved less than Rachel's. And there's other examples of that. But uh, Jacob was preferred in that God was bestowing the blessings and privileges that he had promised through Abraham to Jacob's um, seed rather than Esau's. Okay. So... For, uh just make sure everybody heard and understood what Susie say that the hated and loved thing is it talking about that God despised Esau, wished it to hurt him, that kind of hate. That's not it. It's just that there was a greater love for Jacob, but, but even that had nothing to do with their salvation. It's not talking about their eternal destinies. It's talking about this promise that was made through Abraham, which as we saw, there had to be a choice. It had to be Esau or Jacob because the promises would come true through one. God had to choose. Okay, so as regard the election, back here in Romans chapter 9, it was the election according to the purpose of God, but it was talking about uh, the promise to Abraham being fulfilled that Jacob's descendants would become a great nation and Christ would come through them and so on. Okay, now we need to, there's more inf information we can say about that. Anybody have any other comments on uh, what Susie had to say? Any other comments anybody has about these passages? The older will serve the younger. Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. 
Anybody? Well, let's do a little bit of background on it then. Look at Genesis chapter 25. Let's see what was stated when these statements were made to begin with. Genesis 25. We'll come back and we'll see the first time when this statement was made. Paul is quoting it in Romans 9. But it was stated to begin with, clear back in Genesis chapter 25, in verse 22 and 23. I can turn back there, please. Genesis 25, verse 22 and 23. And we're told something important about it, even when the statement was made. So let's go back and look at Genesis 25, verse 22 and 23. Who'd like to read that for us, please? Steve, please. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went to the choir of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. All right. So there's the passage that was quoted in Romans 9. And notice it before they were born. They're still in the womb of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau. But the prophecy is talking about who? Who is it talking about? Is it talking about Jacob and Esau as individuals? When it says the older shall serve the younger? Who's it talking about? Terry? The nations. It says it's the nations. There it is in black and white. Two, uh, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. One people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the other. Talking about the nation which is, has to do with the book of Obadiah. The nation of Edom as compared to the nation of Israel. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about anybody's eternal destiny, salvation or eternal punishment. It's talking about nations and the, the conflict that will arise between the nations. And the nation of Edom would serve the nation of Israel, which generally was fulfilled, which generally happened. Okay. Nothing about eternal punishment, whatever. Okay, other comments on Genesis 25. Okay, the other passage, uh, which says, uh, Jacob have I loved and Esau I have hated, is found in Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. If you turn there, please. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. And we'll see the other statement in the context when it was made. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. And who'd like to read that for us, please? Malachi chapter 1. And I haven't got there myself yet. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. Who'd like to read that for us, please? Malachi 1, verse 2 and 3. Who'd like to read that, please? Frank, please. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackal, jackals of the desert. Okay, so there's the passage. Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. But now was that spoken before the boys were born? No, this is the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Hundreds of years after the boys had been uh, born, this was not a prediction ahead of time of what God was going to do about them. This was spoken long, long after they were born. It has nothing to do with their eternal destiny. Again, it's talking about the nations and how God is going to deal with the nations that came from these, uh, these people. Okay? Other comments on Romans 9 and how people have misunderstood the relationship in those prophecies regarding... Jacob and Esau and the nations. Well, let's, let's summarize then what we've learned. Genesis 25, the elder shall serve the younger. Let's talk about the nations, the descendants, not the individuals. And it has nothing to do with eternal salvation. And there are some scriptures that show where it was fulfilled because the nation of Edom did serve the nation of uh, Israel or Judah. The other passage, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated, is uh, from Malachi chapter 1 again, not talking about eternal destinies, also talking about the nations and the fact that God would, which nation God was going to use to fulfill the promise to Abraham. Hated has a 
means lesser love, as Susie pointed out. And uh, here's a number of scriptures that show that there was conflict between Eden and Israel, just like God predicted, even before they were born, there was going to be conflict. And we're going to see before through the book of Obadiah, many, many scriptures, look at them all, many of them, where God said he was going to punish the nation of Edom because of how they treated the nation of Israel. All right. So it's important for us, as we get into the discussion, to understand uh, what we're talking about here. That we're not talking about the salvation of individuals. We're talking about two nations, and in particular here, we're talking about the nation of Edom and what God was going to do to them because of their mistreatment of the nation of Judah. All right, other comments before we uh, move on? Anybody? All right, so we have then... In these first nine verses, I've emphasized the statement we're going to see that the people of Edom were received by the pride of their heart. We've already seen that they would be small among the nations and greatly despised in verse 2. What does that mean? Small among the nations and greatly despised in verse 2. Anybody explain what that, what that involves? What do you think that means? Comments? Susie? Well, in comparison... Many of the surrounding nations, like Babylon, Assyria, Syria, Egypt, etc., were were larger nations. Where Edom was a smaller nation, but they grew to be greatly despised because of their um, cruelty and wickedness, and their alliances were Edom. Okay, and so even as you read through the Bible, uh, you read, read about many great nations in the Old Testament, Egypt. Syria, Babylon, uh, many great nations, uh, even Syria uh, was great but compared to, to Edom. But what did Edom do that was important or significant? Uh, and there was conflict between them and lots of other nations. So exactly what God said here through Obadiah is true. There was a, a nation, they were relatively insignificant. But they were, considering how small they were, they were greatly despised. Other comments then through verse two. All right, let's read some more and we'll make some more observations then. Who'd like to read? Let's try verses three through five. Who'd like to read verses three through five? Chapter one, but what on chapter? Verses three through five. Bill, please. Verses three through five. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the cliffs of the rocks whose habitation is high. You who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground, though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set as your nest among the stars. From there I will bring you down, says the Lord. If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh how will you be cut off? Would they then not have stolen till they had enough? If great gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some cleanings? Okay. Verse 3. What does God say about the pride of Edom in verse 3? What did you say about Bill? It has deceived you. Right. Your pride has deceived you, and then it describes more about it. What was it that was they were so proud of, but they ended up being deceived about, Steve? You had it. An arrogant sense of security. Okay. Uh, uh, arrogance about their security. Why? What was there, did it say, that made them think they were so secure uh, that they were proud about it? They thought nobody could bring them down. What was it about cause that? Susie. Um, it was, their area was totally mountainous. The mountain, Mount Seer. And they thought they were protected because nobody could um, find them or get to them. Um, yeah. Okay, so they, it was their situation, they says, that uh, your habitation is high, you dwell in the clefts of the rock, and so you say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? You can't beat me because I'm safe and secure in this, these mountains all around me, all right? So let's look at some evidence of that. They trusted in this location. God said he's going to bring them down nevertheless. All right, so here is, uh, looking in closer in our map, 
again south of the Dead Sea is the area of Edom and here's some of the main cities Basra and so on we look at Petra the location of Petra today is very well known archaeologists have has thoroughly uh, located it look here at the location of uh, uh, Petra down here in this valley look at the rocks around it see that they said nobody can conquer us because we are surrounded uh, in the clefts of the rock. Who's going to bring me down? All right, and here's some more close-ups of some of the, the uh, buildings that they built. Here's a temple that they built. Notice they just built them right on the side of those mountains. Uh, they just carved out their temp this temple right on the side of the mountain. And here is a, a theater just carved right into the, the mountain. That's, that's what their security, they thought they were saying. Here's the tre treasury. You probably have seen pictures of this other places. Uh, just uh, like a bank building, we would think. But they just carved it right on the side of the mountain. And that's where they, that's what they thought would make them safe and secure. That's what verse 3 is talking about. They thought they were secure. They are proud in their hearts because they thought nobody could possibly bring them down. So they trusted in their secure location. Okay? But what did God say about it? In verse 4, what's God say about it? Bring down. God says, Though you ascend on high as an eagle, though you set your nest up among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. Now what's special about eagles as described here in verse 4? How, are, how do eagles keep their nests safe and secure? The very highest places where nobody can get to them. Okay, and they go up at the top high of the mountains. High places. They put their nests there so that they'll be safe and secure. And that's what he says. If you were like an eagle and went high and put your nest among the stars. Of course, he's exaggerating. That's poetic prophecy. But I'm going to bring you down. You think you're secure, but you're not safe from me. I will bring you down. Okay? The pride of your heart has deceived you. You think you're safe, but you're not. You're not safe when God determines to punish you. Okay? Other comments to verse 4. Uh, how about verse 5? Uh, you got an illustration here about thieves, robbers, and about uh, those who gather grapes. Question number 13. Uh, what's the illustration, first of all? What's he say about the thieves and the, those who gather grapes? What did you say about him in verse 5? <laughs> Terry. Um, that even a thief comes in at night to rob, but he only takes what he wants. <clears throat> he doesn't take everything they have. And the same with the grape gatherers. They gather, if they're going to steal your grapes, they only take what they need. Okay. Or want. Yeah. So even a thief doesn't take everything some people have. Uh, he, he takes the things that uh, he, th he considers more valuable or whatever, things he can carry. But And uh, those who gather the grapes leave some grapes. They don't take them all. But what's the point of the illustration? What does he mean? What does he say? It doesn't spell it out, but what's the conclusion? He will have nothing left. God's not going to leave even that much. Okay? Even what a, a gate rather grape gatherer would need. God's not going to need that much. Okay? Sure. In Jeremiah 49, uh, Jeremiah's uh, prophecy against Eden has a lot of similarities to this one, and he makes uh, almost the exact same illustration in verse 9, but in verse 10 he does specify it, and he says, but I have made Esau bear. Okay. Alright, so nothing's going to do that when God gets through. Okay? All the comments to verse 5. All right, let's read a couple more verses. Uh, let's read 6 and 7. Who would like to read verse 6 and 7 for us, please? Verse 6 and 7. 10. Oh, how Esau shall be stretched out. How his hidden treasure... Sorry. Oh, how Esau shall be searched out. How his hidden treasures shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to, to the border. Uh, the man at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. Okay. 
So now he's going to tell us a little bit more about how this, ha how this is going to happen. Uh, verse 6, first of all, he says Esau is going to be searched out and his hidden treasure sought after. But what does he tell us about it in verse 7? What does he describe uh, that's going to happen according to verse 7? Who's going to be responsible for what's their downfall? Verse 7. Bill. The men of the Confederacy. Confederates, right. Confederacy. Yeah. In other words, they're friends. They're going to be betrayed by friends. Uh, they will, uh, men at peace, will deceive you and prevail against you. And uh, those who eat your bread with you will lay a trap for you. You're not aware of it. You don't know it. But that's the way it's going to happen. Now, I don't know the answer, the fulfillment of that. Maybe some of you have an idea, a thought about that. I don't know who this was, but the point is they would be betrayed by friends uh, who would uh, somehow allow people to get into that rocky territory and that they would then be overthrown by their enemies. But it would come by the help of their, their friends. Okay? Other comments? All right. Now, Sharon has brought up a passage which is similar. Other passages prophesying the punishment of Edom. So I ask you question number 15. What are some other passages? There's lots of them. Uh, what are some other passages that prophesy the downfall of Edom? Anybody have another you'd like to, for us to look at? What was yours, Jeremiah 49, Sharon? Yes. Okay. But have some others. Question number 15. Other passages where God predicted the downfall of Edom. Terry. Terry. Uh, Ezekiel 25, 12 through 15. Okay, you want to read that or at least what parts you feel are pertinent? He says, um, this is the Lord God because Edom has acted revengefully against the house of Judah has grievously offended in taking vengeance on them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off from it man and beast. I will make it desolate from Teman even to Dedan. They shall fall by the sword, and I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. They shall do to Edom according to my anger, according to my wrath, and they shall know my vengeance, declares the Lord. Okay. Okay. Any other passages you want to point out? Anybody? Susie. Joel 3.19 um, Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness because of violence against the people of Judah for they have shed innocent blood in their land. Okay. So we even read about it in Joel, didn't we? And we'll see it some more. Now, one reason that I wanted to mention that is, first of all, is because it's very common in the prophets, the downfall of Edom. There are other nations, too, that they prophesied about a lot, but Edom was one of the main ones, even though it's a small nation. And it seems like that God is using Edom as a sort of a case study, uh, sort of an example of what he's going to, to do to those who not only disobey him and live in evil, evil lives, but in particular, uh, attempt to harm his people. And so that's what we're going to see the book is about. Edom's going to fall because of their mistreatment of God's people. Did I see another hand? Okay. Anything else anybody has before we close tonight? Get through verse 7. All right. Well, uh, Terry. One thought that came to me while I was studying this was God does not forget. He's not going to overlook, even though he doesn't punish immediately. That doesn't take it off of your responsibility about that sin. And it's very clear. This goes way, way back with Edom. Uh, and he just doesn't forget. He's not going to overlook our sin. Okay, we talked about that before, too. We talked about that in the book of Amos also, didn't we? That God remembers. Uh, he's patient. He oftentimes gives people or nations time to repent. And it may very well be that right now he's giving the United States of America time to see if their people will repent. But he's not going to wait forever to bring punishment. Okay, we'll take up in verse 8 next time. Thank you for your participation.